Then I can see your face. You can see my face? Yeah, look. Is it scary? No. This is the easiest woodworking project that I have ever made. It is simply a tabletop with some metal legs attached to it. Now you may be asking yourself, if it's the easiest table you've ever made, why are you doing a YouTube video on it? Well, because I wanna show you how I totally screwed it up. So let's get into it. For this project, I'm using five quarter rift and quarter sawn white oak. And the first step that I'm taking here is looking at the boards that I have available to determine how I want to go about milling the lumber. Here specifically, I'm looking for any bowing or cupping of the wood to determine which face I want to join first. Once identified, I will mark that side and lay it face down on the table. From there, I will mill one face until it's flat enough to not affect the planing process. And yes, I said flat enough because at this point it doesn't need to be perfect because I will likely rotate the board on my passes through the planer to ensure that I'm taking an equal amount of material off both sides. Doing so keeps the board balanced, thus minimizing movement after milling. After all of my boards are to the desired thickness, in this case, just over one inch, I lay the boards back on the table to get an idea of what the top will look like, as well as get an idea of how wide each individual board will be. You will also see that I have a couple boards in the background. I will always mill up additional lumber on a project so that I have something to pull from if needed. I will not be using my jointer to join an edge on these pieces. Instead, I like to use my track saw to give me a clean edge. This is mainly because I find it much easier to do this as opposed to using the jointer, specifically I'm talking about with very long boards. When I identify the edge that I want to cut, I will mark it on the board, as well as write the final width that I want the board to be. This just gives me a very quick reference when it's time to rip them to the final width at the table saw. Once I have the boards ripped to final width, it's time to lay everything out and adjust the boards until I am pleased with the look. A couple of things that I'm paying attention to in this step include any defects in the wood, color variation, grain variation, the width of the boards, and I'm looking to establish some sort of pattern in most cases. Once the boards are to my liking, it's time to glue up the panels. One thing that I love to do on glue-ups is take a few extra minutes to apply some tape to the bars of the clamps. Yes, this does take a little bit longer, but I will tell you that it's way less time than if I was to not do it and then try to clean off all the glue at a later date. And you can ask me how I know that. For this project, I decided to glue the top up in two sections, and I did this for a couple of reasons. The first reason is because it's a lot easier to manage, and the second reason is because I knew I would be running both halves through a drum sander. And because I will be running it through a drum sander, I can get away with a little bit of glue-up error here. I say that because I am clearly not using any sort of alignment aid for these panels, like dominoes or biscuits. I'm not too concerned with this at this point because the drum sander is going to smooth everything out. However, this does not mean that I don't try to get everything perfect. One tip that I find is very helpful is to take a flat, rigid board and put some Tyvek tape or something similar on it. This will stop the glue from sticking to the piece and it will make it possible to reuse this in the future as long as it still remains flat. Where this comes in handy is to apply pressure and ensuring everything stays flat while tightening the clamps. After the clamps have been tightened down, I like to clean up any excess glue off the piece. I would much rather spend the time doing this now than trying to sand it out later because, well, I hate sanding. I do this on both the top and the bottom. Now, remember earlier when I said I would run them through a drum sander? Well, this is my buddy Drew, and he has this massive machine, and he was nice enough to give me a hand with getting these two panels nice and flat. 
And I'm glad that he was there to help, because believe it or not, it isn't as easy as just feeding the boards in and it comes out perfect on the other side, especially on something this long. We did make a couple silly errors on the bottoms for the first few passes, but in the end, we were able to get everything sorted out. Once back in the shop, I took the two halves and folded one onto the other, and again used my track saw to cut both pieces simultaneously. Similar to what you would do with a jointer, but without all the headaches of moving them around. Once cut, I can then fold it back over and check to see how my joint will look. And the joint came out perfect, but as you can see here, it was a little high in the middle. And that takes me to my next step. Before I said I wasn't worried about using any sort of alignment aid, well here that's definitely not the case. To join these two halves, I use the domino because I want to make sure that that joint comes together perfectly. Because of the width of this, I'm not going to have a drum sander to even everything out. And this is where the domino really shines. I lay out all of my marks, spacing them about every 9 inches or so, and I do this because it will do a much better job of keeping everything level when the boards need a little bit of persuasion. This table is a total of 42 inches wide, and because of that, it was just barely too big for me to get the clamps underneath it. So my solution to this problem is to use a base of a 4x8 sheet of plywood underneath. This allowed me the support that I needed, and as you can imagine, I applied some glue, I whacked in some dominoes, and then I clamped the two pieces together. Really nothing surprising here. After I allowed the top time to dry, I then used my track saw to finalize the dimensions of the top. I started by ripping it to width, and then I used that same edge to square up the ends. Next it was on to the part that I hate more than Mike coffee, and that is the finishing process. I like to start with the lowest grit, and after that I will apply any edge treatments that I want. And on this table specifically, all I did was break up the edges with an eighth inch roundover bit. Then I will smooth those routed edges with a sanding sponge, and finally I will fill any voids with epoxy or CA glue depending on the severity. While I still have that aggressive grit on my sander, I will then use that to smooth out any filling that I apply. From there, I worked my way through the grits using a cross-hatching pattern. And the grits that I usually go through are 80, 100, 120, 150, and then 180, ensuring to wipe down the surface between grits. Sometimes I will skip 100, but this has worked well for me. I never go above 180, unless maybe I'm doing a cutting board or something like that. After the sanding is complete, I use a little bit of compressed air to blow everything off, and then, since I'm applying Rubio Monocoat, I also wipe down the entire table with the raw wood cleaner that they offer. I am using Rubio Oil Plus 2C in the color Natural, which we have found looks absolutely amazing on white oak. Now I know what you're screaming at your TV or your phone right now. You're saying, Jason, why did you sand to 180 if you're using Rubio? The table is going to fail. It will never work. Well, everyone, I hate to say it, but I get the best looking results when I sand to 180. And you can tell on me if you want to, but I'm not gonna change that. Once I've spread it over the entire table, I will use my random orbital sander with a white scotch bright pad on a low speed and really work the oil in. As soon as I am happy with the coverage, I will wipe off any excess oil with some of these blue shop towels. And for the love of God, do not use terry cloth towels unless you want to be picking lint out of your furniture for hours. These blue towels are a much better option in my opinion. After letting the tabletop dry in the shop for a couple of days, I decided I would need to bring in the big guns to help. And by big guns, I mean my wife. We put the tabletop upside down on the floor, and then Leo proceeded to have a breakdance party on it.
For the bases, we're using these beautiful powder-coated metal bases that were made by Bidwell Wood and Iron out of California. And these were made exactly to the size that I wanted. And we wanted to get an idea of exactly where we wanted those lakes to be on the table. And the way we did this is we placed all of our chairs at the table to see what would give us the best layout and the best look. Very comfortable yeah. area that doesn't become a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's the way to do it. Yeah. To attach these to the underside of the table, I used Rampatech threaded inserts, which are also available from Bidwell. These are the only threaded inserts that I have found that don't make me want to rip out the last little bit of hair that I have. I started by marking the holes that I want to use. Once marked, I can pre-drill all of my hole locations. And next, I will thread all of the inserts in, but not quite all the way just yet. I will go back and add a little bit of CA glue to the threads, and then I will screw them all the way down. Finally, I can use the matching black screws to tighten everything down. And on this part, I needed a little bit of help from Leo. Leo, no, you did it. You did do it. Let me just make sure it's good, okay? Now, the only thing left to do is to flip this thing over and see what the finished result looks like. And it turned out exactly how we wanted it except for just one little thing. So what did I screw up? It looks great, right? Looking on the camera and the lighting, it all looks amazing. Well, <laughs> I screwed up the finish and I'm gonna explain to you why after I show you what I'm talking about. So if you remember earlier in the video, I was talking about uh, when I did my sanding, I used what's called a cross hatching pattern. And what that basically means is you're going with the grain and then you're also crossing over those laps going across the grain. Now, the technique itself is not really the issue. It's how I didn't follow through with it on my last grit of sanding. And what I'm sure you can see in the video because this little thing over here, uh, which everybody thinks is so fantastic uh, and it's called natural light, it's not so fantastic because after I had this set up in here for about an hour, I walked from one room to the other and saw what you're seeing on camera, which is all of the lines that are like this. So what happened was, is I would go with the grain and then across the grain, I'd move to my next grit, I would do the same thing. When I got to my last grit, I did not take the time to go back because at this point I was so excited to be done with the project and actually go with the grain again because that will get rid of all of the lines that you see here. And that didn't happen. So what I have to do, and the only way to fix this is that I have to sand down this top, moving with the grain, and reapply the finish. Now, I built this table in October. It is now February. And the reason why I've been waiting so long is because I wanted to refinish the table. However, I still haven't refinished the table. But that is going to be the solution to this um, looking at it, you know, from just about every other angle, it looks fantastic. It's when the light from that window hits it and it doesn't look right. So the biggest thing that I want you to take away from this video, if you didn't learn anything else, is that just because stuff is on YouTube and it looks all pretty and it looks all great, um, doesn't always mean that there's nothing wrong with it. I make mistakes and so does everybody else that's building stuff. It's just that on camera, it's very easy to hide. I'm not somebody that necessarily likes to hide that stuff, so I wanted to share with you my ridiculous mistake that if I would have just taken five more minutes, everything would have been fine. But now I get to refinish the whole tabletop. So remember that next time you're out in your shop and you're kicking yourself for making some sort of mistake because it's not perfect. Because guess what? It never is.